Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In this passage, Romans 12 and 1, we have a therefore that the theologians and Bible teachers will always say that when you see a therefore, stop and see what it's there for. And typically what it means is we are to consider everything that has been said up to this point because Paul is about to make a point. He's about to bring us, as it were, to the altar call of his message, and he is asking us to consider some things. He has been preaching for 11 chapters, and I don't doubt for a moment that Paul couldn't have stood up and articulated Romans chapters 1 through 11 in a sermon. He was so thoroughly versed in God's Word and in the Gospel. And he reaches this passage and he says basically this, based upon everything that I have said to this point, based upon how God has saved us by grace through faith, he has put away our sin, he has delivered us from sin, he has done all of these things through the power of the gospel. In response to that, we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Now this, saints, is the language of priesthood. Now Paul was a Pharisee, but he often thought and taught like a priest. His messages are very much in step with things that would take place in the temple in the wilderness tabernacle. And in this case, he's drawing our attention to the Old Testament when the priest would take a spotless lamb they would take this animal and they would offer it unto the Lord, in particularly in a burnt offering to God. Now this was a different offering than maybe what you would have on Passover or maybe a sin type offering. This would be a whole burnt offering. Now at Passover and other times, they wouldn't just throw the meat away if they sacrificed it, but they would eat it, okay? The people would, and sometimes they would give a portion to the priest, sometimes they would give a portion to the person doing the sacrificing, or, or that they were sacrificing for, rather. But a burnt offering was different, because it was given 100% to the Lord, only to God. It was to be burned until there was nothing left except ashes. And Paul is saying, I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, to present your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice. If I could say it this way, as a living burnt offering, 100% to God, completely given to the Lord, burning for Him continually. Not burning until there's nothing left, but just continually burning for God, burning for Him as a light, burning for Him doing His will. You see, this was what we do when we worship the Lord. It is the complete giving over of ourselves unto God. Christianity, and you know this very well, is not a religion, if I could say it that, where you just serve God on Sunday, Sunday morning and Sunday night, or maybe on Wednesday night, that we just become a Christian when we come to church. Our lives are to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. This is 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. There is never a time, saints, where I just switch it off and I'm no longer a living sacrifice. There's never a time when I just say, you know what, I need to take a break from Christianity. I need to break, take a break from the Lord and go do something different. We don't do that. We give our life completely to the Lord. You see, the first step towards living a spiritual life is to realize that we are not our own. We have been bought with the price and we are to offer our body. That's me. That's my person unto the Lord. All of me, 
my hands, my feet, my thinking faculties, my mind, my eyes, my ears, all of me, I give it to the Lord. And that is quite a thing, isn't it? I'm not just giving God part of me. I'm giving him all of me. Just like a living burnt offering, just like the burnt offerings of the Old Testament, completely consumed. You see, as we burn for God throughout the week, we are ready for the various Christian gatherings that we have. I remember it was G.W. North who made the statement, and I never forgot it. He's long since been with the Lord. If he was living today, he'd probably be 110 years old. But he was a tremendous influence in my life. But one thing he said I never forgot. He said, we bring a week's worth of living into every meeting that we come into. I'm going to say that again. We bring a week's worth of living into every meeting that we come into. If we've not been burning for God, if we've been doing other things, if we've been letting our mind run wild with ungodly thinking, we've been letting our, our lives just go out of control, when we come into the meeting, saints, we're not ready to have church because we're bringing a week's worth of living into the church. You see, I can't get out of the car here on the parking lot and just switch it on. Everything that I've been doing all week long impacts my ser the service as far as I'm concerned. I was talking to my grandson Tate and we were talking about our lives and our lifestyles. We were talking about things like shows that we watch on television. You know, Grandpa, why don't you watch certain shows or, or why do you do their different things? It's because of the way in which some shows impact me as a person. I can't allow that. I can't allow that spirit to impact me because I can't do it. Because here's the thing that I try to do in my life, saints. I try to live my life continually before the Lord. I try to have my thoughts as often as possible pointing toward the Lord. I want to be doing things all throughout the day that are edifying, that are building me up. Because just one slip, saints, it doesn't take long for the devil to get a foothold. I'm not saying we could backslide in a day, but what I'm saying is if we're not careful, we can start a bad pattern in our life, and the next thing you know, we are not doing things that are spiritual. We're not offering our bodies to the Lord. You see, I want to give my mind to God. I want to give it continually to God. I want to give my eyes to the Lord. I want to give my ears to the Lord. And this is vitally important. This is the very first thing. How we live all week. Are we burning for God? Or are we burning for something else? Because the enemy is always trying to get us excited about something other than God. So that we give our whole lives to it. I remember when I was in junior high school, I had friends, and one in particular comes to mind, that he was so given over to sports that he knew all of the major athletes in all of pro football and pretty much could tell you their height, their weight. He could tell you how fast they could run a 40-yard dash. He knew everything about them. You say, why was that? Because he was burning for football. He was burning for football. So football was in his mind. He was eat, sleeping, and breathing football. Well, I want to eat, sleep, and breathe Jesus Christ. That's how I want to live. That's what it takes, saints, for me to be in a place to where I can even get up behind this pulpit and minister something meaningful to you. You can't just live any old way and preach. You can't just live any old way and have something useful for people, something edifying, something that is from the Lord. So we have to give ourselves over to the Lord as a living burnt offering. Secondly, notice what Paul said. And be not conformed to this world. Now we're going back to what we talked about this morning. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I heard a preacher saying just this last week, I believe it was actually Billy Graham. Someone was playing some old recordings of his. And he was talking about the mind. And he said that something that I really liked. He said, your mind is the only thing you have when you're all alone. It's just your own mind. What are you thinking about? What are you dwelling on in your mind? 
He talked about thoughts coming into my, our mind, and he said something that I've heard before. He said, you know, we can't control all the thoughts that come in our head, right? Just like you can't control the birds flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair, right? So we can keep the bad thoughts from nesting, as it were, in our mind. Thoughts of evil, thoughts of hatred, thoughts of bitterness, thoughts that would not please the Lord. Saints, listen, our thought life needs to be pleasing to the Lord. Did you know tonight that God knows your thoughts as well, if not better, than you do? He hears what I'm thinking. He hears what I'm entertaining. He is privy to it. And I want my thoughts to be acceptable before the Lord. This is what David said. He prayed that the meditation of his heart, the things that he thought about, would be acceptable unto the Lord. But this goes back to why we need to make sure of what we subject ourselves to. Listen, if I'm listening to music, if I'm watching television programs, if I'm reading books, if I'm reading magazines that fill my mind with thoughts that don't please the Lord, I need to get rid of that. The Bible talks about bringing every thought unto captivity and unto the obedience of Christ. That's how important it is. We need to have control, saints, of our own mind. And we need not let our mind just wander. The devil puts a thought in your mind. I rebuke that thought in the name of Jesus. I cast that thought down in Jesus' name right now. Because some thoughts need to be rebuked. Some thoughts need to be rebuked in the name of Jesus. Devil, you're not getting in my mind. So you say, well, Brother Robert, what do you do? I'll tell you what I do. As much as is possible, I try to listen to sermons. I try to listen to the Word of God. I try to listen to music that is edifying and building me up, helping me keep my mind on track because the world is trying to get control of my mind, of my thinking, to try to press me, back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, into its mode of thinking so we think like the world. I couldn't even imagine what it would be like going to secular school today. Could you imagine? You're a kid, you're going to school, you're hearing all this nonsense, your friends are full of nonsense, the teachers are full of nonsense a lot of times. You open up the book and it's full of nonsense. Think of how hard it is to keep control of your mind today. There's a battle for the minds of people. Now, notice something he says, and you don't see this come through in the King James, but this was pointed out to me a number of years ago by a Greek scholar. And I want to point it out to you tonight because I think it would be very helpful for you. Notice what he says. I'm just going to read it from the King James. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Word of God will renew your mind. Spending time in prayer will renew your mind. The Holy Spirit, as we allow him, will renew our mind. Watch this. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word prove and I'm not going to get technical with you tonight, but it is a word that could be translated approve. Not prove in the sense that you're going to prove something like an argument or you're going to prove something whether or not it's legitimate or not, but approve of it. You see, saints, when we allow God's word to renew our minds, it puts us in a position to where we approve of God's will. You remember me saying that this morning. We have to agree with God. we got to approve of what God's Word is saying. If we do not renew our mind, all of a sudden, if we're not careful, the thoughts of this world will begin to push us into its mold, and we will no longer approve of God's will. We will not approve of it. In other words, we will not agree with God. The renewed, renewed mind wants to do God's will. But the mind that is conformed to this world will reject God's will. It'll reject it. It'll say, I don't believe that. Maybe not overtly, but it will not accept it. And that is important. The question comes down to this. When we are, are dealing with something, some type of topic, or we're going through something, does our mind, because it's been renewed, discern God's will? Are we able to tell what God's will would be or not. Our mind saints, as soon as something we encounter something that is contrary to God's will, 
should be able to say, this would be God, this wouldn't be God. Listen, God is never going to tell you to hate somebody. God is never going to tell you to mistreat somebody. God is never going to tell you to be bitter towards somebody. So if these thoughts are in your mind, you know automatically that is not God. And it needs to be cast down. This is, this is vitally important. Because when we renew our mind, we are able to tell what is of God, what is not of God. We're able to not just, not just able to, to accept it or reject it, but we're able to discern it. I want to read this translation that I have from what's known as the International Standard Version. And this is how they translated this passage. But be continually transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may be able to determine what God's will is, what is proper, what is pleasing, and what is perfect. You see, when we renew our minds, saints, we're able to see clearly, more clearly, what God's will is. God's Word and God's Holy Spirit will always agree. God will never tell you to do anything contrary to His Word, ever. The same God who inspired the Scriptures is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And God will never tell you to do something contrary to God's Word. I had a person say something to me one time that I found quite disturbing. They said, the Lord spoke to me and told me not to talk to you for a while. Really? So, what you're saying is, the Lord is siding with the fact that you have some kind of grudge you're trying to grind. Listen, saints, I don't even need to pray about that. That's a good place to say amen. Some of you are conflicting with what I'm saying, and you, you should really listen. If it doesn't agree with God's word, you need to reject it. Do not think that some behavior you're trying to do that is contrary to God's word is acceptable to God because it isn't. God's word and God's will always agree. God's Holy Spirit always agrees with his word. God never moves contrary to his word. And these things are very basic, but they are very vital and fundamental. And some people, they, they think crazy thoughts and they don't understand that it's the enemy putting these thoughts in their mind. I just want to close tonight reading a cognate verse or passage of scripture that where Paul elaborates on what he's talking about, about your mind. And that's in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. And I'm going to read down to verse 32. So if you want to follow along, you can, or you can just... Or you can just write it down and maybe listen. <clears throat> Notice what Paul is saying to the Ephesians. Here's another therefore. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Notice that. Vanity means emptiness. It means worthless thoughts. Having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You see, they're spiritually blind and they're living a certain way. They're walking a certain way. They're living a vain kind of life. Verse 19, who being past feeling, in other words, they're so callous, they have given themselves over to lasciviousness, which is gross sexual immorality, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20, but you have not so learned Christ. You see that? Jesus didn't teach you that. Jesus didn't teach you to behave that way. You see what he's saying? That's not what you learned from Christ because there's a certain type of behavior that you learn from Jesus. Notice this, verse 21. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. You see that? This is a life that we live that is in conformity with Christ likeness. Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, that's a fancy word that means manner of life, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed, here it is again, in the spirit of your mind. That's the key. The mind being renewed, not just the thoughts, but the spirit of your mind. 
When I, when I subject myself to things, saints, when I subject myself to certain things, it can alter the very spirit of my mind. Young people today, they listen to music that is so violent that it alters the spirit of their mind. They watch television programs that are violent and it alters the spirit of their mind. And it makes them very angry. It makes them have a very negative attitude. Verse 24, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, verse 25, putting away lying, speak everyone truth with their neighbor, for we are members one of another. How many of you still believe that it is a sin to lie? I watch these statistics all the time. People get on talking about everybody lies. No, everybody doesn't lie. That's another lie from the devil. Not everybody lies. If they do, they need to repent and stop lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not allow the sun to go down upon your wrath. What is he talking about? He's talking about coming to a place when you become bitter. I was doing a study just last week as, as I was studying some other topics out. And did you know that the Hatfields and McCoys, it became a family feud that went back, that was sparked by some things that happened during the Civil War. But what really got the thing going, believe it or not, was a feud over a hog. Now think about that. It was a feud over a hog that tipped it off. And pretty soon, you have these families warring against each other, fighting against one another. This is a mentality that comes from the devil, saints. And it is, it is the result of people allowing bitterness to erupt until whole families are fighting. This is not from God. This is from the devil. And when these thoughts come into our head, we need to cast them down and allow the, the Lord to renew our mind. Neither give place to the devil. Don't give him a foothold in your life. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him work, labor, working with his hands the thing which is good they may give to them that need it. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. By your words you're going to be justified, saints, and by your words you're going to be condemned. Jesus said on the day of judgment, every idle word that proceeds out of our mouth we're going to give an account of. When we're just recklessly talking, we need to be careful. But that which is good to the use of edifying. In other words, building folks up with the things that we say. That it may minister grace to the hearers. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed to the day of redemption. What is he saying? When you do these things, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit, let me tell you what that does to you, saints. It makes, it makes you have a sense of of the Holy Spirit is not near to you. You don't have that sense of closeness. You don't have that sense of, I'm filled with the Spirit. And it, as God is somewhat a little bit distant because of your behavior, that only compounds the problem. Because now the presence of God that you need to be able to walk before the Lord the way He wants you to is not present because you're already behaving badly. So you see how this problem becomes systemic. It's like a disease that causes other problems. And this is why it's important. Don't behave, don't do these things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Whereby you are sealed under the day of redemption. Verse 31. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The word malice means meanness. Being mean to folks. Verse 32. On the contrary, but be ye kind one to another tender-hearted. Isn't that what we need today? We need to have a tender heart. I don't want to ever have a hard heart. I want to have a tender heart before the Lord. It doesn't make any difference. You know what? Sometimes we can get so hard-hearted, we can become so callous that we're not even sensitive to the dealings of God. We're not even sensitive to the things people are going through. You never know what somebody can be going through, saints. Don't ever just assume. You, know, you don't know what somebody's going through. I think about people right now that, you know, I hear people talk and they say one thing and that about this person, but they don't know some things that I know about them that are vitally critical about things that they're going through, that if they knew it, they wouldn't speak a word against that person. They wouldn't dare speak a word. They would too be, be too ashamed 
to say anything. We don't know what people are going through, Saint. We need to be tender-hearted. We need to forgive one another, even as Christ. God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. If God forgave me, I can forgive someone else. I can forgive them. The Bible said we should be able to forgive 70 times 7 in the run of a day. I've never reached that. I remember some guys threatened me one time at work because I wasn't in, wasn't in the union at that time. It's like, it's like, almost like, you know, we're going to beat you up. And I was like, well, Lord, there's how many of them is there? <laughs> I'm counting up to 490. Could I survive this before I can react? I know that sounds funny. But I was always thinking biblically, even then. I knew that I was not going to be able to retaliate against them in that situation. You say, why is that? Because we want to be Christ-like. We want to be tender-hearted. And the Lord worked the situation out. And you'll find, saints, that if you'll give it to God, he'll often work it out. And you don't have to take matters into your own hands. Renew your mind. Do things that keep your mind being renewed, saints. If you're able, get some Bible tapes. Get some Bible CDs. Listen to God's word. Get some worship music. Get some sermons. Do whatever you can. And just let God constantly be renewing your mind so that our minds are pleasing to the Lord. And then yield yourself over to God all week. You say, why is it important? It's important for this if for no other reason, for this reason, that it impacts our services. It impacts your life, but it impacts us. If you have someone in the service that really needs God, that really needs a touch from God, we need God to move in the service. If it was you that was facing that doctor's report, you'd want everybody in that service to be on, on par with God. You'd want everybody who laid hands on you to be right with God. You'd want them to be close to the Lord. And when we have people coming to the church, saints that are not saved, we need to be in a place where we can minister to them. We need God to move in the services and touch them and, and deal with them. Father, we're so grateful tonight because you're such a good God.